everyday injustice. Too many wrong for convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Hello and welcome to the Everyday Injustice Podcast. I'm your host, David Greenwald. For the past 10 years, we have operated Vanguard Court Watches in California, including San Francisco, Sacramento, and Yolo counties. Our goal? Expose everyday court injustices, and now, more broadly, shine a spotlight on injustices in the entire criminal justice system, in the form of wrongful convictions, police and prosecutorial misconduct, and mass incarceration. This podcast hopes to take it a step further and highlight criminal justice reform on a national level. Everyday Injustice. Today on Everyday Injustice, we have John B. Gould, who is the Dean of the School of Social Ecology at the University of California, Irvine. Welcome, John. Pleasure to be here with you. So, I want to start with the question that I had, which is, what is social ecology? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. I get that all the time. It's not a term that many people know. In fact, we are the only school of social ecology in the country. The closest is the, is the school of human ecology at Cornell. So this is a term that actually comes from several decades ago. <clears throat> we were interdisciplinary before it was cool. We were translational before it was cool. But really the other thing that holds us together is that we believe in systems-based thinking. And here's the best way to understand it. Let's take a topic that's really hot in the news right now, which is the fact that a lot of young people are exper experiencing depression. So a traditional way to think about this is what do we do for the kids? Well, we get them counseling, we get them medication. A school of social ecology says, we need to be thinking about the health of their home life, we th need to be thinking about the health of their community. And if we're gonna be thinking about the health of their community, we also need to be thinking about the health of the environment. So all of, this, all of it is tied together and we really think about systemic solutions to social problems. So what is your background and how did you get to this point? <laughs> I like to say on a good day, I'm a Renaissance man. On a bad day, I'm a dilettante. So I have been a lawyer. I have worked in politics, I've worked in human rights, but for most of my career, I've worked in academe. I'm a lawyer um, and a, I, have a, sorry, I have a law degree and a PhD. I am a big believer of the intersection between research and policy and practice. And I've, had a very, I've been very fortunate over my career that the academic positions I've held have allowed me to do that. Uh, this has been a school, the University of California, Irvine, and the uh, university, I should say, and a school of social ecology that I have been interested in for over a decade. And I was very fortunate that in January 2022, they let me come and join them and be the dean. Um, and I'm most familiar with your work on wrongful convictions and uh, some of the criminal justice reform stuff. It, um, so it's kind of interesting to see your kind of evolution on this. It is um, because I didn't start in this area. I actually started in the area of uh, what's called public law, trying to figure out how judges decide things. And I was hired at my first university with thinking that that's what I was going to do. My first book was on uh, hate speech regulation, something I still care about. And I got an opportunity to work with some colleagues at George Mason, where we started looking at legal actors in the criminal justice system. But I will tell you the thing that if there was a seminal moment for me, it was that I was teaching a class on criminal procedure to a group of undergraduates. And we were talking about the right to counsel. And this was about the same time that the Fifth Circuit case was pending where someone was challenging his capital conviction on the basis that his attorney had fallen asleep during the trial and that he had still been convicted. And he was claiming that this was unconstitutional. How can you convict me and sentence me to death when my lawyer has fallen asleep? And at about that time, a panel of the Fifth Circuit took the case and concluded that 
this was actually okay. This was constitutional because maybe the lawyer was sending a signal to the jury that this was such a snoozer of a case that he was falling asleep. And I had an undergraduate who was either a junior or a sophomore who raised his hand and said, look, if you're telling me that this is acceptable, if this is constitutional, I don't believe in any of this rule of law stuff. How can you tell me that the justice system is just when this is allowed? And I didn't have an answer for him. I had no answer for him from that case. Now, fortunately, the Fifth Circuit heard that case on bonk eventually and overturned it. But it got my brain thinking about the problems in the justice system. And about that time, I was introduced to some people who were working for uh, what became the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project. And I had a chance to look at some of these cases where there had been some error in the justice system that sent an innocent person to um, some sort of um, imprisonment or worse. And the thing that really fascinated about me about these cases was, sure, there was lots of litigation on these cases. And these, um, these defendants were getting good representation post conviction. But I was fascinated about where it was, and it was anyone taking a look at these to figure out what had gone wrong in the first place to try to prevent them in the future. And I was lucky to find a group of people who were interested in doing more on this. And we started something that was called the Innocence Commission for Virginia, a group of nonprofits, 11 law firms that gave us about a half million dollars worth of pro bono time. And we did a deep dive into 11 cases, known cases of wrongful conviction in Virginia to try to figure out what had gone wrong in these. And we came up with a series of findings and a number of recommendations. And that kind of launched my career because what I then realized having looked at those was that all of the work we were doing on wrongful convictions didn't have a control group. It's like looking at a series of cancer cases and saying, oh, we found these particular sources in the cancer cases, they must be causes. And you don't know their causes until you know they're specific to cancer and not to any other thing. And same thing in the criminal justice system. We look at certain sources and we think, ah, these are causes, but we don't know that their causes are wrongful conviction as opposed to just things that are found in all kinds of criminal cases until we do a control group. So that's what got me started in this research. A really long answer, I'm sorry, to what was a short question, but I hope there was something of interest in there. Well, well, there is, um, because, you know, part of the way that uh, the innocence movement has evolved over the last 25 years is they've gone and they've identified, you know, I, I think it's now like 3,000 cases in the National Registry uh, of exonerations, and you know they they find that in 25 percent of these, it's eyewitness identification. Uh, I'm making that number up, but you know, uh, you know, there are things like uh, ineffective assistance of counsel and and uh, uh, improper forensic science, which you know um, gets a, a little closer to the point that you were making. I mean, do we really know that those are causes or are those just defects in the system that happen to present themselves in wrongful conviction cases? So I'm going to take a, a, a scholar's, a researcher's perspective on this and say, we generally know those to be factors in cases that are problems. Do we know them to be absolute causes? Not necessarily. Now, I led a study several years ago where we looked at a series of wrongful conviction cases against what we called near miss cases. In both of these situations, someone who was factually innocent got indicted. And in some of these cases, the near miss cases, they ended up having the indictment quashed or, they, or, or the case was dismissed or they were acquitted at trial on the basis of factual innocence. In the other set of cases, the person got convicted, but later the case was exonerated. So what we're able to look at there is what sources get you, get you into the criminal justice system when you're innocent, which sources end up getting you convicted when you're innocent. And they are not necessarily the same. So for example, um, false confession cases or false confessions, we found those to be linked to the getting into the system, not necessarily the wrongful conviction. 
Now that doesn't mean that one set of these is problematic and one is not. And when reporters would call me when we released this and they would ask me, well, what's the solution here? And I would give them this answer that they never liked, which is it depends. It depends on which do you care about more? Do you care more about ensuring that the innocent are not indicted in the first place? Or do you care more about ensuring that the innocent don't get convicted? I'd like to think we care about both of them, but certain sources that we found in our research were linked to the convictions and others were linked to the indictments. I'd like to think again, that we all believe that whatever the, whichever one of these problems the source is connected to, it is problematic in and of itself. Yeah, it seems to me, you know, getting somebody indicted who's innocent is, is a problem in and of itself. It is. On the other hand, one could say at least the system in those cases filtered the person out so that they did not end up with a conviction, a fine, a sentence of confinement, or even worse, a capital conviction. I would say that. That would give them a D rather than an F. <laughs> well, I, here, let me say this part too, yeah. because there's a tendency, I think, sometimes when you look at the innocence movement to think that they are by definition anti-prosecutor or anti-police officer. And, and who knows whether they are or not. But I think any of us who studies wrongful convictions realizes that the vast majority of these are not intentional. They are people of goodwill making unintentional but serious errors that have us having identified these problems would like to think that they will now take measures to prevent them. So some of this is human nature, some of this is any process. To me, the big question is once these problems have been identified and possible solutions have been proposed, do you fight it? or do you make the change? And if you fight it, I have no time for you. But if you're willing to make the change, if you're open to evidence, empirical evidence of what's going on, if you're open to improvement, if you're an evidence-based practitioner, I'm there with you. I, I, I hear you and, and I don't disagree with any of that. My, my point was more along the lines of, once you get into the system, it seems to me a, uh, it takes a lot to actually get you out of the system. Oh, um, there's no, oh, no yeah. question about that. But it takes a whole lot more to get you exonerated once you've been convicted than no disagreement. You are simply in the system. Because until the conviction, it is still possible to convince a prosecutor that, you know, you have the wrong person there, or potentially a judge or maybe even a juror. Once that presumption of um, accuracy has been leveled with the conviction, it is, well, you know this, it is incredibly difficult to get an exoneration. So um, I, I tend to um, be more concerned about what ends up, the factors that end up being associated with conviction. But at the same time, if we could deal with those problems that end up getting you into the system in the first place, wow, potentially we could uh, sweep a lot of cases out. So shifting slightly, um, what is the Criminal Justice Act? So the Criminal Justice Act is what we know from Gideon versus Wainwright. It's the act in the federal system that provides legal representation to criminal defendants who cannot afford it on their own. And it sets, well, it itself did not set up, but it has then set up public defense systems in the federal system or panel attorneys, that is, private attorneys who agree to take cases for which they will be paid by the state, or actually, excuse me, by the federal government. And you were appointed to evaluate the operation of the Criminal Justice Act. Almost. Almost. So there was a committee that was appointed by Chief Justice Roberts to evaluate the criminal justice system. I was appointed as a reporter for that committee, which means my job was to help them make sense of what they were seeing um, and to help them in the drafting of their report. The report was theirs, not mine. I have written myself on what I saw in there, but I was not tasked with 
coming up with the conclusions or making the recommendations. Understood. So how how did that come about? Well, there had been previously regular evaluations of the Criminal Justice Act by the federal courts. They were several years overdue to do it. Um, and so the Judicial Conference, through uh, J uh, Chief Justice Roberts, created the committee. It was done in coordination with what's called the Defender Services Committee of the federal courts. And here it might be helpful for people to appreciate that the federal courts are run by this thing called the Judicial Conference, which is really a committee of federal judges, along with the Administrative Office of the Courts, which is this behemoth of an institution that is charged with the administrative function of the courts. Within that structure, within the, it's called the AO or the AOC, within that and within the Judicial Conference, there are particular committees of judges who have particular parts of the, um, the federal courts that they're responsible for. So one of them is called the Defender Services Committee. It, not surprisingly, is responsible for the federal defense function. Uh, one other thing, which is the federal system, it's a little unusual. Actually, it, some states, what am I saying? A number of states do this. But it is, to the lay person, a little unusual in that the prosecution function in both the federal system and the state systems is this separate entity. It's through the executive branch. It's through the Department of Justice on the federal side. The public, the, the defense function, the public defense function is through the courts. So this, we talk about an adversarial system. Well, the prosecution gets its own agency. The defense function gets funded, gets administered through the courts. And there is oftentimes competition between the courts as themselves and the courts administering the defense function as to who's going to get the money. I, I, my own view is there is potentially a conflict of interest in this. Uh, I will say that I don't necessarily think that members of the committee saw it that way, but I would note that they did recommend at the end of their evaluation that the federal defense function should be put into an agency, a separate agency under the federal courts, like the Federal Judicial Center or the Sentencing Commission, uh, the Judicial Conference and Chief Justice Roberts rejected that. So aside from that, what were your major findings? It is impossible to look at the public defense function in the United States and conclude anything other than the caseloads are ridiculously high. Resources are not necessarily being brought to bear to help defendants investigate cases and present their cases at the same level that the prosecution gets. And that no one other than the defenders seems to care about this. I have yet to see in the federal system, um, a, an institution of judges or in the AO that is fully committed to remedying this. There is a Sixth Amendment violation that goes on every single day in our court system, state and federal, and no one seems to care because criminal defendants are some of the least attractive constituents in the United States. Yeah, and, and we see this in California in the state system too, um, you know, whereas, you know, California is probably one of the better funded uh, public defense systems. It's still, you know, uh, pales in comparison to all the resources that the prosecutors have. Well, I can remember I did an evaluation of one um, county court system in the state that will go unnamed, but let's just say even it is one of the better resourced ones. And I remember just watching a daisy chain of defendants, daisy chain, they're all hooked by um, handcuffs at the wrist, one to the next, the next, the next, the next, oh, yeah. all brought into court, all not represented. Now, these were serious misdemeanors, but um, not so much that anyone would have gotten more than six months in jail, all unrepresented, all offered a plea deal by the judge, not by the prosecutor, 
all of them accepting it without having a single idea of what it was that they were truly being charged with, what they were pleading to, and most importantly, what the collateral consequences were to this conviction. And I have I've done court observation and human rights work in a lot of former Soviet countries. And I will tell you, it looked exactly like what I saw in Romania in the early 90s. And this is California in the 1990s and 2000s that I was observing this. It does not speak well of our criminal justice system. Yeah, I saw that actually take place in Sacramento, except worse because they put these guys in a cage um, in, in the in the jail court, and then they uh, have them plead, and they're not represented yet. And for those of us who care about what rule of law means, this should matter. And this should matter whether you're left or right. And in fact, some of the greatest supporters of criminal justice reform I have met have been those on the right who are libertarian, who are very concerned about the exercise of state power, about what's the state doing to individuals. I am not saying that all of these guys who come through the criminal justice system are innocent or lovely people or that they don't deserve punishment. What I am saying is that if we are going to punish people and we call ourselves a civilized um, democracy with the rule of law, then we owe them the opportunity to fully understand what they're being charged with and the opportunity to truly defend themselves. At that point, the exercise of state power makes complete sense. Now, wouldn't you say at the core that, that this problem relates directly to the problem of wrongful convictions? Directly, no, uh, connected, absolutely. So they are, they are all signs of failures in a justice system. Some of them are for different reasons than others. I think the general procedural problems in the justice system, the ones you and I were just most recently talking about, have to do with the fact that changes necessary would require a lot more money and that we as a society don't feel comfortable taxing ourselves more, particularly when the money would go to people who are typically seen as not um, as powerful, not attractive. I mean, there, many of them have actually committed the crimes. It is hard to get public uh, sympathy and interest in taxing themselves to provide more procedural protections for those individuals. Now, what I would say is that's actually what a civilized society ought to be doing. But apart from that, we know that there are tremendous racial and ethnic disparities in the criminal justice system, and we are simply perpetuating them, if not accentuating them, if we're not dealing with the failures. Simultaneously, we are seeing some similar but other different causes of wrongful convictions that more attention to and additional money could, uh, could potentially resolve. And I, will I would contrast all of this to what we see with the National Transportation Safety Board and what we see in morbidity and mortality conferences in the hospitals. So when a plane goes down, the NTSB immediately sends a team out to the scene to figure out what happened so that they can come up with recommendations and changes to prevent another crash that would kill other people. We don't want crashes to happen. Similarly, in hospitals, when someone dies in the hospital on an operating table or otherwise, doctors will get together and will try to figure out what happened to pre prevent future deaths if they can. Only in the criminal justice system do we put on blinders and say, oh my God, don't look here, it's not a problem. Only recently have we seen Sentinel Events Review begin in certain justice system, which, systems, which is a multi-party, non-blaming way of looking at problems to try to fix them. But that's still rare. All too often our instinct is to say, uh, you know, they're probably guilty and oh, I don't want to, I don't want to look behind the curtain. That's not 
what an advanced democracy does, or it's not what an advanced democracy ought to do. You know, I have a great deal of patriotism in this country. I just want our country to live up to those ideals. And one of the things you do is when there's a problem, you try to figure out what happened and you try to prevent it in the future. So from your perspective, uh, what would be the biggest change uh, or or what would be the change that you would make that you think would have the biggest impact on this? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think, and we've actually, we actually just saw this, um, some data came out recently. I can't even remember where it was. I want to say it was in California, but I may be wrong. The biggest change that we could do is that we could provide earlier representation for criminal defendants and more resources so that they are truly able to pro provide a, an adequate defense. Now, why is that important? Number one, it holds the prosecutions and the police's feet to the fire. And when there are failures or weaknesses in the case, they will be identified and those cases will be lost. Now, if the people are factually guilty, ultimately, do I want those cases lost? No. So what will that do? That will improve the professionalism, we'd like to think, of police and prosecutors so that they would actually fix those failures in the system so that they are identifying the right people and they're going about things properly. The other thing we just saw in this research was that early representation actually ends up leading to less offending by defendants down the road. Why is that? We're not entirely sure, but we think that it means that defendants are getting the resources um, and the uh, resources and treatment where possible, rehabilitation were, uh, were available to be able to address the problems that are leading to the criminality in the first place. Because none of us is in favor of crime. We all want to nip this in the bud earlier. So it's a long way of saying that I think if we had earlier representation of criminal defendants and on more kinds of cases, ultimately we would see a much better criminal justice system. So I happen to be familiar with that study. It came out of the California Policy Lab and they ran um, the study on, I forget what they call it, uh, but it's in Santa Clara County um, where, where they basically, um, it, it's kind of like what uh, the San Francisco Public Defender's Office has done for years, which is their pretrial review unit uh, where where they go in immediately and, and begin the representation as opposed to waiting uh, till arraignment for somebody to be appointed. Well, I'm, I'm, that, that that's, doesn't surprise me. It's out of that court system. That's generally been one of the um, more forward thinking court systems in California. All right. So, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the review of the Criminal Justice Act, has anything come out of that? They've done some tinkering at the edges, but in terms of the big ticket items that the committee recommended, nope, nope. And that is both disappointing and I regret to say not surprising. So what will it take to make those kinds of changes? Uh, new judges in the federal courts and a new chief justice. So we're, we're stuck for a generation. Yes. I, 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 I'm sorry to be uh, a pessimist here. I'm, I generally try to lean towards the optimistic. It would take uh, a significant change in the leadership of the administrative office of the courts the membership of the Judicial Conference, and that Chief Justice willing to make the kinds of changes necessary to truly implement the recommendations made. I would also note that many of these recommendations have been made in multiple committees of the federal courts, and they keep getting ignored. So it's not like people aren't aware of what has been found and recommended. They are just turning a deaf ear to what's necessary to resolve them. It seems like in general, we know what needs to be done, but nobody's willing to kind of step up and take a chance to do it. Oh, I don't think it's that. I think this 
This goes against the ideology of many people. This goes against the institutional interests of other judicial entities that share budgets with defense services. Uh, I think it's those things. It's not a question of, is someone willing to step up? I think there are ingrained reasons for multiple parties to not be interested in making any change. Is there a legislative possibility here? Could there be one? Absolutely. Under the current Congress? Absolutely not. Now, that, I, frankly, that's where there, there uh, Ted Deutsch um, years ago had a, a bill in Congress to address some of this. Uh, it didn't get very far. And I believe that was, um, I'm racking my brain as to whether that was when the Democrats were in the majority in the House or not, I cannot recall. But you have to remember that of all the priorities at the federal level for legislation, this is never gonna be one of the top 10. This is gonna be the kind of thing that a Congress gets to after they've dealt with a lot of other things. But could they? Absolutely, they could do this. I just don't see that in the immediate future. All right. Well, we're out of time for this show. I want to thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your experience. It's a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, probably go on a little too long about all of this, but I appreciate the opportunity for an audience. We've been talking with John B. Gould. He is the Dean of the School of Social Ecology at UC Irvine in Irvine, California. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mouse Quake Barrett for the use of our opening Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com. That's justiceforgeorgepowell, all one word, dot com.